Let's pray, and I covet your prayers because I slept poorly last night, and uh, so hopefully what comes out will come out correctly. That's why I need your prayers. Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your faithfulness to each and every one of us. I thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, your love, your faithfulness that's already been alluded to and sung about. Father, I thank you for your presence and the power of that and what a difference you make in our lives when we lean into you and rely on your spirit to enable us to accomplish what you have asked us to do. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that the message is really about you. And I pray today that we would see you more clearly. We would love you more dearly and follow you more nearly. Thank you for your word. And just I pray for your enablement now in sharing it. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen. So it happened again last week. I read a statement that captured my attention. We were created to live in a forever relationship with a forever God forever. We were designed to live based on a long view of life. We were made to live with one eye on now and one eye on eternity. Kind of like those those chameleons. Is that the ones that can do that with the eyeball going different directions? But how often do we focus both eyes on the here and now or this present fallen world believing it will eventually become the paradise we're longing for, what we're all searching for. Sadly, when this doesn't occur, and it never will, we become disillusioned, we become depressed. And if we're careless, we can even doubt God's goodness, especially when living for Him triggers nothing but cultural pushback. Lord, I'm trying to do this for you, and all I'm getting is a pushback. Tripp calls this eternity amnesia, when we're so wrapped up in our present age that we lose sight of the divine forever. I believe this mirrors the same concern voiced by the unknown author of Hebrews, who challenged his believing Jewish readers not to retreat from their Christian confession or confidence. You may remember the verses. Holy brethren, partakers or companions of the heavenly calling, consider or fix your thoughts on the apostle and high priest of our confession or profession, Christ Jesus. Why him? Because without God the Son, our Savior, there's no salvation, making our confession moot. Or what about this verse? For we have become partakers, here's our word again, or companions of Christ, if we hold the beginning of or stick firmly to our confidence, our assurance, belief in Christ, steadfast to the end. And why do we possess that kind of confidence? Because Christ is better than Israel's prophets greater than heaven's angels and superior to who? Big M, Moses. And don't forget this one. Since then, we have what kind of high priest? A great high priest who is passed through, not merely into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Let us remain firmly Committed to our salvation. Wait a minute. That's not right. Let us hold fast our what? Confession or profession that's based on our salvation. Which is all about God the Father holding us via His Son and not letting go because He is the Apostle and High Priest of our confession. With that in mind, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 again. Page 1063 in the Burgundy Covered Pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to go back to verse 1 and start there. 
add a few other things as we make our way further today. Verse 1 of Hebrews 4, Therefore, in light of what happened to Israel in the past and those that died in the wilderness because of an evil heart of unbelief, therefore, since a promise remains or still stands of entering His rest, God's rest, let us fear, have this godly, reverential, profound respect for God, lest any of you seem to have come short of it or fail to reach this rest. For indeed, the gospel or good news was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard from God did not profit or benefit them, not being mixed, blended, or united with faith in those who heard it. Now, you may be asking, how was the gospel or good news conveyed to Israel under Moses when he was leading them? It was communicated in type or in shadow. And I quote, the earthly Canaan, wherein they failed to realize perfect rest, suggested to our current readers to look beyond to the heavenly land of rest, to which faith is the avenue and from which unbelief excludes as it did from the temporal Canaan. Two words stood out from last Sunday, rest and fear. But perhaps the most concerning was the phrase, lest any of you seem to have come short of it or failed to reach it. Before moving from the repercussions of unbelief in the life of God's children to His remedy for unbelief, allow me to mention a similar exhortation from Paul's charge to the carnal saints of Corinth. Can you believe such a thing exists? Carnal saints. They were in Corinth. And Paul wrote to them. He said, examine yourselves as to whether... You are in the faith. Prove or test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified or fail to meet the test. Does that sound a little disconcerting? Basically, it's one thing to personally claim Christ. But is there enough public evidence to convict me of being a Christian? Whether we're seeking to walk in godly fear to counter an evil heart of unbelief or searching our hearts for certification of genuine faith, each endeavor deserves our best effort, both of them equally. What happens when we neglect these spiritual disciplines, when we avoid the difficult passages simply because they're uncomfortable? I don't fully understand it. I don't quite like this, and so I'm just going to stay away from it. Well, we risk missing out, missing out on God's best, which includes enjoyment of His rest, both now and for how long? Forever in the future. Now, before sharing a quick review on these various biblical aspects of rest, I'd like to address a question I received last week regarding the fear of the Lord, or more specifically, my response to it. I share this based on the assumption that if one person is asking, others may be as well. Here's the query. What does a good kind of fear or reverential respect look like? What does Scripture teach while leaving room for rest? Great question, isn't it? I answered, the best I can do is to draw from my earthly experience with my own father, who, for better or for worse, modeled the fatherhood of God to me. He wasn't perfect, but I knew he loved me. How did I know? He verbalized it. He showed it in numerous ways and was consistent when it came to discipline. My dad believed in controlled corporal punishment for rebellion or wrongdoing which I needed on more than one occasion. Just keeping it real. I loved my dad, but I also possessed a proper fear 
or reverential respect for his authority, especially when the belt disappeared from his waist. My spankings were not over the top. They weren't for every little infraction. They were reserved for the stuff that deserved it. And he meted it out. However, despite those moments, I wasn't afraid of my dad. Do you understand? I wasn't afraid of my dad. I didn't grow up living in fear. I didn't grow up cowering every time his shadow crossed my path. Our home was a happy and peaceful place most days. And I felt safe there. I felt secure there. You could label it restful. Again, I knew my father loved me in large part because he cared enough to do what? Discipline me. Even though those moments were very unpleasant. And not just for me. I don't think he got any jolly out of doing that. We're going to actually explore this more in Hebrews chapter 10. But I hope maybe that sheds a little bit of light, gives some fill on, on this balance between the fear of the Lord and also experiencing rest because of that in the midst of it. Let's, let's briefly review those various aspects of biblical rest. Beginning again with number one, the physical rest encompassing Israel's occupation of the promised land. That was after wandering in the wilderness for how long? Forty years. Though it wasn't without struggle as they entered into that land. They had to fight some battles there. They had to, to, to keep following God throughout all that. Secondly, there was a Sabbath rest of God following creation's completion. When God rested, he became inactive or refrained on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Ryrie describes it as enjoying the sense of satisfaction and repose that comes with the completion of a task. And don't we all experience that? I mean, the lawn is just a wheat field, and you finally mow it, get it all weed whacked and everything, and you go, wow. I can just rest, sip my lemonade, and say, job well done. Now, did God rest because he was worn out? He was exhausted after creation. Hardly. For he neither faints nor is weary, Isaiah announces. Does a divine pause from creating the cosmos mean a termination of all work? Not according to Jesus, who after healing on the Sabbath announced, my Father is working still, and I am working. How? Redemptively. By rescuing men's souls as well as their bodies. We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day, Jesus told His disciples before healing a blind man. Night is coming when no one can work. A third aspect of rest is associated with salvation. Even sanctification, of which Israel, again, is a type or shadow. In contrast, the wicked or godless are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest or remain quiet, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace or rest, says my God, for the wicked. That is not the case for those who by faith have ceased from their striving ceased from their self-effort to put their trust in Jesus alone, who said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Talk about a change of state from activity or work to a cessation from work that results in a feeling of refreshing tranquility and an absence of tension or worry, especially that God provides. We're talking about a supernatural, God-given rest. You can't buy this at Walmart. You can't take it in pill form. Fourth is that victorious or triumphant rest amid the earthly battles like Israel fought during her conquest of Canaan, throughout the acquisition of the promised land, a complete reliance on God was necessary. Faith in Him, demonstrated through their obedience, was their ticket to fully possessing what He had promised. The same courtesy 
was not extended to those with hard and disobedient hearts. They died in the wilderness. And finally, there awaits what we're all looking forward to, that future eternal rest in heaven. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Is that good news? To be sure. Into God's rest we enter by faith when we trust in Jesus, observes Adolf Saffer. Into Sabbatismos, or Sabbath rest, we enter when our day work is finished and we rest from all our labors. This is the heavenly rest that John highlights in the Revelation. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Won't that be a great day? Look at verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 4. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they, unbelieving Israel, shall not enter my rest. Where? In Canaan. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, long before Moses' arrival, and the declaration of a promised land rest, which many failed to reach because of unbelief. And I quote, although the rest in Canaan was subsequently attained under Joshua, yet long after, in David's days, God in the 95th Psalm still speaks of the rest of God as not yet attained. It's still yet to be. Look at verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. In this way, and God rested, he refrained from working on the seventh day, from all his works. And again, in this place, Psalm 95, they shall not enter my rest. According to these verses, especially verse 4, when did God begin resting? The seventh day. Is anything said about concluding his rest? Is anything said about resuming his work of creation? Nada. Which, in the words of F.F. F. Bruce implies that his rest, a sense of satisfaction and repose, continues still and may be shared by those who respond to his overtures with faith and obedience. It's there. It's available. Look at verse 6. Since therefore it remains, it is still to be realized that some must enter it, this rest, and those to whom it was first preached back in Moses' day, did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying, In David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The third time, these specific words have been repeated. Do you sense an urgency in our author's voice for his present day audience, whom he feared was on the verge of returning to the relative safety of Judaism to avoid the rising persecution of Christians. Is he concerned about that? Is he has an urgency about that? He certainly does. He said it three times. I don't want you going back to Judaism. I want you to keep on with Christ. The divine warning, states one commentary, is applicable to them as it was in the days of Moses or David. If they treat the saving message lightly, if they tempt God by trying to see how far they can presume upon His patience, they in turn will forfeit His rest. The repercussions were serious. Feelings of tranquility would be routed by inner turmoil. The absence of tension or worry would be replaced by conflict and discomfort. The enjoyment of God's salvation rest would evade them just as it does today whenever our hearts grow hard or stubborn towards heaven or humanity. Let's talk about relationships. They can be wonderful, right? Husband, wife, 
parent-child, pastor-parishioner, siblings, friends. They can be wonderful. They can be the icing on the cake until emotional upsets or betrayal occur. Then if handled incorrectly, closeness dissolves, distance creeps in, creating separation rather than unity. And honestly, there's nothing restful about relational conflict, especially with God. But thankfully, it doesn't have to stay that way. Look at verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, temporal at best, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day or a true rest. There remains, therefore, as yet unoccupied or unrealized, a rest, a sabbatismos for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest, God's rest, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. That this future eternal Sabbath rest in heaven won't be fully realized until we reach glory is clearly taught in Scripture. It is quite literally part of our spiritual heritage defined by Peter as an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. What a rest will be ours in that day. Explained in one resource as rest from weariness. Anybody weary here today? Sorrow. Anybody experiencing sorrow today? Sin. Anybody ready to be free from that? Rest in the completion of God's new creation. Behold, I'm making how many things new? All things new. Moses, the representative of the law, could not lead Israel into Canaan. The law leads us to Christ. And there its office ceases as that of Moses on the borders of Canaan. It is Jesus, the antitype of Joshua, who leads us into the heavenly rest. Thank you, Lord. However, though this rest remains for the people of God, it does not prevent us from living presently in its light by faith just as those Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11 walked by faith while awaiting their eternal homeland, their heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. What is our life if not a preparation for paradise? He's getting us ready. Look at verse 11. Let us therefore, in light of all this, be diligent Strive, make every effort to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. Hmm. Resting by faith in Jesus and laboring to enter that perfect rest which remains. Paradox or privilege? Perhaps two verses will bring some clarity. The first one's heavenly. The second one is earthly. Here's the first one. I'm sure of this. Paul encouraged the saints of Philippi. That he, God, who began a good work where? In you. This is all about him. Will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Will heaven uphold its end of the deal? You can bank on it. But what's our part on this side of eternity? Our part is to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, or with confident assurance in Christ, according to the author of Hebrews, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Interesting fact about Colossae. It was located in an area prone to earthquakes. So these saints understood Paul's admonition about not shifting just as the Hebrew readers grasp the warning to give the more earnest heed to the things they had heard, lest they begin to what? Drift away. Again, as we learned earlier, let us hold fast our confession or profession based on our salvation, which is all about God the Father holding us via His Son, the Apostle and High Priest of our confession. 
I begin today with a captivating quote. We were created to live in a forever relationship with a forever God. For how long? Forever. We were designed to live based on a long view of life. Why does knowing this matter? Because it will prevent eternity amnesia, which will assist us in avoiding the repercussions of unbelief. If I can have that heavenly mindset every day of my life, what's that going to do to my faith? It's going to fuel it. Trip gives this reminder. Long view living is wise living. Long view living is Godward living. Long view living in light of eternity is hopeful living. Long view living will make you thankful for grace. And in my own words, for the rest we enjoy now while waiting for the eternal rest yet to come. Long view living. Final question. Is there a remedy for an evil heart of unbelief? There is. Are we able to counter a lack or lapse in faith? Yes. How? Through the word below. What we hold in our hands. And through our Lord above. The one helping us in more ways than we'll ever fully understand. That's how. More on this next Sunday. When we wrap up chapter 4. And that's my goal. To wrap up chapter 4. But for today, let's close with a timely reminder of just how much each of us really needs the Lord.
the Lord said, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. And as a result of that, find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And my, how does that characterize our lives? I know it does mine. He's promised so much. And yet sometimes we just say, nope, I'm going to do my thing. And we don't experience the rest at that moment. Even though it's ours for the, the enjoyment. So that's a challenge this week. Lord, I want to walk in it. I want to stay close to you. I want to experience the rest that you alone can provide. Amen? Let's stand together. We'll close in prayer. Father, I need help in doing this. We, as brothers and sisters in Christ, need your divine help in accomplishing this. Dear Holy Spirit, thank you for being that energizer within us, that supernatural power source. That as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, as we are attentive to His Word, as we're going to learn next Sunday, and realize the priest we have in the heavens who is helping us, we understand that, hey, there's a remedy for unbelief and things that would draw us away, even if it's the rising persecution. God, we... we long to experience the rest that is ours in salvation in Christ. We look forward to entering that ultimate rest in your presence. But until that happens, we need you. And we thank you that it's a walk of faith and that you're faithful to us. So we give the week ahead to you. Pray your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Thanks for coming and packing out the early...